2011 uh, form B number five, we have uh, some information about uh, position and velocity for this guy on a unicycle going on uh, east-west track. And it says that uh, the table <coughs> um, gives a uh, distance here in measured, in, uh, measured in meters from the west end of the track at time t. And the uh, <coughs> velocity here is in uh, meters per second. And in part A, this is use the data in the table to appro approximate the acceleration at time five. And so uh, <coughs> we don't have a velocity equation here, so we can't find the acceleration equation. Um, however, we know that if we were to uh, have this velocity curve, which we certainly do, if we found its slope at a particular point, that's going to be our acceleration. The acceleration is the derivative of the velocity. And we have, uh, we have 0, 2 as a point on the velocity curve, and we have 10, 2.3. And they want the approximate velocity at 5. So these two are surrounding 5 in terms of time. So I would suggest uh, just finding the slope between those two. So if we do 2.3 minus 2, 10 minus 0, get uh, 0.3 on top, 10 on the bottom. So it'll be 0 0.03 be meters per second squared. So we're dealing with an acceleration. Okay. And ultimately, if you uh, <coughs> calculated that slope correctly, it should be 1 point. You did. You gave yourself one point. <coughs> Part B. You give us an expression 0 to 60 of the absolute value of E of T dt here. And they ask us to, uh, <coughs> using correct units, interpret the meaning of that in the context of this problem. <coughs> so ultimately, we know that the absolute value of a velocity curve is always going to give us total distance here. Okay. So it'll be. Uh, Total distance traveled over <coughs> zero to sixty seconds. And units would be what? Be meters. Expression would give us the total distance traveled <coughs> in meters from 0 to 60 seconds. And uh, <coughs> the, uh, if you got that part right, that's uh, one point for recognizing that's total distance. Uh, <coughs> this is another problem where there's one point at the end where if you get the units in A and B right, which meters per second squared and meters, if we got those right, we get another point right now. We'd have three total at this point if we got the meters and meters per second squared right. <coughs> <coughs> so, units with one also. All right, and then uh, they asked us to uh, actually calculate this total distance traveled using our uh, right Riemann sum, or left Riemann sum, it says. And so, uh, ultimately, the uh, distances that we have here, we go 0 to 10, and then 10 to 40, and then 40 to 60. Those are not uniform subintervals. So, ultimately, we start at the left end point, though, if we're doing left Riemann sum, and the height at that point would be 2, and the length of the interval is 10. Then the next height is 2.3, and that interval length is 30. And then we're at 2.5, and that interval length is 20. And we don't use, remember, the 4.6 because that's the right end point. We don't use the right end point when we're doing left Riemann sum. So we'd have 20 plus <coughs> um, 30 times uh, 23 would be... 669 and 22.5 times 20 would be 50. And if we add all that up, <coughs> we'd get uh, 139 meters. And if you calculated that correctly, another point there. Questions so far? Well, for uh, part C here, it says uh, between 40 and 60, must there be a time when Ben's velocity is 2 meters per second? Um, and again, that hopefully we've had enough experience with these kind of problems that we should think mean value theorem as soon as we see that because you know, we're looking for a time when the velocity, when the instantaneous velocity is equal to something. Okay? And so ultimately, if we were to do from 40 to 60, we know that at 60, the uh, point 
is 60, 49. At 40, it's 49. And again, those are the two uh, positions on the point, or those, those are the two uh, points on the curve that is the uh, position. And remember, if we were to uh, draw those, <coughs> draw the curve that connects those two, whatever it may look like, uh, we know that since this is a continuous function, uh, that slope between the two endpoints is always going to equal the derivative at least one time. Okay. So it could be something like that. And the derivative here of the position curve is the velocity. So in other words, the velocity has to equal the slope between the endpoints okay, at least once. And conveniently, what is the slope between the endpoints? 49 minus 9 and then um, 60 minus 40. So 40 and 20, which is what? 2. And <coughs> so since the slope between the endpoints is 2, then the derivative has to equal 2 somewhere in that interval based on the mean value theorem. So mean value theorem guarantees. That the derivative that the, which in our case is the velocity equals slope between the endpoints and in terms of velocity what is that slope between the endpoints number wise it's two but what is it really in words What do we calculate when we do a change in position over a change in time? You might be right. Take a chance. <laughs> oh, what are you risky? Too risky. <laughs> yeah. velocity? It's a velocity. What kind of velocity? Just change in position over change in time. Slow. Well, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it the average velocity? you get for not saying anything. Okay. So remember in, in context of velocity, the mean value theorem guarantees it's like that truck problem that the instantaneous velocity has to equal the average velocity at least once. Right? Okay. Alright. <coughs> then in uh, the last part here, part, uh, part D, we have what amounts to a related rates problem. Because they've given us an equation here. <coughs> oh, sorry. That was uh, worth two points for that. Uh, one, if you calculated, if you showed that slope was equal to two. And then the other with the mean value theorem justification. Okay. Um, they give us an equation here that uh, has L of t squared plus 12 squared, or equals, not plus, 12 squared plus B of t <coughs> squared. And it says that the, uh, the light is uh, directly above the western end of the track and Ben rides so that at time t the distance between the light and Ben satisfies the equation Lt squared equals 12 squared plus Bt squared. And the question is at what rate is the distance between Ben and the light changing when time is equal to 40? So ultimately we have a related rates problem that should uh, you know, scream related rates when we read that. Uh, and we know that in general if we have an equation which you know, sometimes we have to write the equation. In this case, they gave us the equation, which is convenient. <coughs> we know that our next step after that is to differentiate with respect to time. Okay. So remember, keep in mind, this is like a, a y and an x, if you will. Okay. Both are <coughs> um, differentiable here with respect to time. So if we do our derivative of this, it would be 2lt, if you will. But remember, with differentiating with respect to time, it's going to be 2lt to the 1 times dl dt, and you can write it as l prime if you want to, or dl dt, I usually like to use dl dt here, but either way. Uh, the 144's derivative is zero, and then I'd have 2b t to the one, times b prime, or db dt, if you will. Okay. All right, keep in mind, that's what we're looking for here, is the derivative of l with respect to time, because they ask us, what's the at what rate is the distance between Ben and the light changing? That would be dl dt, the derivative of L with respect to time. 
And so ultimately we need uh, 2 times L of 40 over here times the LDT is what we don't know. B of 40 and then DB DT at 40. Remember DB DT is just the derivative of B which is the velocity in this case so that would be what 2.5? And what about b of 40? The b function's right there in the table, isn't it? What's b of 40? 9. So on this side we'd have uh, 9 times 2.5. Um, and ultimately over here we'd have 2 times l of 40. What about l of 40? On this side? Uh, oh, yeah, I forgot my two there. Yep, thank you. Um, how about L of 40? Because ultimately we want DL, DT is going to be the variable that we're looking for here. Okay. Is there any way to figure out L of 40? Yeah, I mean, this, this original equation right here gives us a relationship between L and B at a particular time, doesn't it? So if we knew that uh, L of 40 squared would have to equal 144 plus 9 squared. B of, two, B of 40 would be the 9. So if we do that, we're going to get 144 plus 81. That's going to be, what, two and, a, 2 and a quarter? So what is L of 40 then? 15. And if we know that, then we got a 15 over here. So ultimately, that's our job here to get DLDT alone then, just be a division problem. So we'd end up with a... Uh, on the uh, bottom, of course, we'd have 30. And on the top, 18 times 2.5. Uh, if you do 18 times 2, that's 36. Plus 9 to 45. Divide both of those by 15. So three halves. And units on that, this is a DL DT. L is a distance, T is a time. So this would be a velocity, it would be meters per second again. All right, and ultimately the uh, point breakdown for that is if, uh, if you uh, found the derivative correctly, with your uh, equation or the re related rates equation, uh, recognize that the dB dt right here is the velocity. So if you recognize that that was nine right there, you got a point for that. Okay. And then the final answer was the other point here, three halves. And remember again, there was one point for the units in parts A and B, so a total of three. Okay, some questions on number five. Check out number six. Number six, we got a McLaurin series problem. And they tell us that uh, we're going to let uh, f of x equal ln of 1 plus x cubed. And this is uh, 2011. 1b, 3c, 6. Right. So, we know that this is our uh, function in question here, and they give us the Maclaurin series for ln of one, over, uh, 1 plus x, not 1 plus x cubed, but 1 plus x. And it says, uh, use this series to uh, write the first four non-zero terms and the general term for the Maclaurin series of f. So, we know that uh, if we have ln of 1 plus x, and its Maclaurin series is... as such. And the general term here, they're alternating, so we've got negative 1 to the n plus 1, x to the n over n. Alright, so remember we can build a new Maclaurin series from one that we already know by just making the appropriate change here. Instead of x, we have x cubed. So what are we going to do with all our x's here? Make them all x cubed. So our Maclaurin series for 1 over x cubed is going to be x cubed 
minus x to the 6 over 2 plus x to the 9 over 3 plus x to the 12 over 4. And then the general term here, <coughs> when we again, it's going to continue to alternate, so we need to add that part. <coughs> and then at this part, if we put an x to the third, if we put an x to the third in here, if I go x to the 3 to the n, that'd be x to the 3n on top. So that would be our new McLaurin series. Again, the general term, we're just plugging an x to the 3 in there. x to the 3 to the n would be x to the 3n. Uh, would it be wrong if you put this on your paper? If you put x to the 3 to the n as your general term? Uh, same thing. So I, I would strongly doubt that you get a point off of that. I think that would be fine. Um, <coughs> so the uh, point breakdown for that one is uh, one point for having the first four terms. And one point for having the general term, so two total. All right, then uh, <coughs> part B here says that the uh, radius of convergence for the McLaurin series is one. Determine the interval of convergence and show the work that leads to your answer. Now, just the fact that it's a McLaurin series means the center is where? Yeah, the center is x equals zero. And if the radius of convergence is 1, that means that the interval of convergence is negative 1 to 1. However, if we just put that, we might be right, but we might not be because what do we have to test? The endpoints. Okay. So let's test the endpoints. If we look at our, uh, uh, <coughs> our uh, negative 1 in here, if we were to put a, a negative 1 into our series here, we'd get, uh, if I just put it into the general formula here, if I put in... Uh, x equals negative 1, I'd get uh, negative 1 cubed, that's negative 1. And then I'd have minus a half, I'd have minus a third, I'd have minus a quarter, and so on. Okay, and you notice that this is not alternating, keep that in mind. True. And let's just say for argument's sake that I factored a negative 1 out of all that. What do I notice here? What do I have uh, in terms of a general here? I would have 1 over n, wouldn't I? And what's the power on n? One, so isn't this P series? Okay. And uh, even more specifically, it's a harmonic series. It's one over n. And so since it's P series, what do we know about this? P is less than or equal to one, so therefore this what it diverges. Okay. All right. So this one diverges because of that. If we were to put in a one instead, if we let x equal one, then we're going to get. 1 into our series up here, we're going to get our terms are going to be 1 minus a half plus a third minus a quarter. So, no, I get that backwards. No, this one was backwards. That should be a minus right there. Sorry. Um, and if we look at that now, now it is alternating. Okay. And are the terms going to 0? So this one's going to what? It's going to converge. That passes the alternating series test. So, therefore, what should our final answer be then? Including 1. So it'd be negative 1. The one, including one. Two points. Uh, I'm going to guess that uh, just the two analyses, making sure that negative one isn't included and that one is and why. Okay. So, and uh, again, they ask you to justify, so you, you know, want to put something like alternate series test here. Questions on number letter B. All right, let's see what we got here with uh, <coughs> letter C. We have, uh, it says write the first four non-zero terms of the McLaurin series for F prime at T squared. Let's start with that. What do we know about uh, if we have F, F of X here, F prime is just going to be the derivatives of all the ones that we did in the first, the first part, isn't it? Okay. So our first term for our derivative here is going to be, uh, we started with X cubed, so it'd be 3X squared minus 3X to the fifth plus 3x to the 8th, minus 3x to the 11th. That would be the derivatives of all of our terms. And we only wanted the first four terms. That's all they are after here. Now, that's f prime at x. We need f prime at what? We need t squared. So we're going to put a t squared into this and get 3t to the 4th minus 3t to the 10th plus 3t to the 16th. 
VAT to the 22nd. Uh, let's see. Yeah, what it says. Uh, yeah, right, the first four, so that's good. Okay, all right. I guess that's it then, right? And that's actually worth two points. Yep. Got that correct. All right, and then the uh, other part they asked us to do was uh, <coughs> if uh, g of x is the integral of f prime of t squared dt, it says uh, <coughs> use the first two non-zero terms of the Maclaurin series to approximate g, uh, for g to approximate g of 1. So ultimately, if we were to uh, take this one that we just wrote and find the antiderivative for it, because that's ultimately what we have there when it asks us to find the integral of f prime, we're going to anti-differentiate it. So if we anti-differentiate it, this g function then is going to be 3t to the 5th over 5 minus 3t to the 11th over 11. See what we just had integrated. And it said only the first, do we have to find the first? Yeah, it just says find the two is two non-zero terms, I guess. I guess that's it. We don't need to go any further than that. We could find the rest if we wanted to, or the other four, but the other two to make four, but we don't really need to. And then ultimately we need to do uh, g of one with that. So it'll be three fifths minus three elevenths. And if I get a common denominator here, it'd be 55. So it'd be 33 50 fifths minus 15, it'd be 18 50 fifths. <coughs> and so one point for this part, one point for that part, and like I said, two for this one essentially. Right, questions on part D. Part D, we have uh, this is a Maclaurin series for G, evaluated at x equals 1. It is a convergent alternating series with individual terms that decrease in, ab in absolute value to 0, which ultimately means that uh, it converges, of course. And then we want to show that the approximation in C must differ from G of 1 by less than a fifth. Okay. All right. So ultimately, this is kind of a um, remainder theorem problem. However, it's actually easier than that. I'm going to show you what, what we want to think of in this case because uh, ultimately if we try to use that remainder estimation theorem, we'd need a, we'd need a, we'd need a maximum value for the n plus 1th derivative, right? <coughs> um, which would be difficult to find in this particular case. Ultimately, though, remember what, what we're trying to figure out is, is how much error there is between g of 1 and what we just found, the 18 50 fifths. Okay? So and we want to show that that error is going to be less than a fifth. So we want this to be within a fifth of the actual answer for g of 1. Okay, even though we don't actually have a, a function for g, we have an approximation for g, but we don't have a function for it. So ultimately, by using this okay, and getting this, we want to know how far away those are from each other. All right? So bottom line here is that that, that difference, that g of 1 and 18 50 fifths, okay, that difference, we want that to be less than 1 fifth. That's ultimately what we want to try to show. All right, and <coughs> what it boils down to is that we can, uh, it's kind of a, an application of our remainder estimation theorem. I'd, I'd be surprised if you uh, got this right. If you did, that's good. But um, ultimately, on that, uh, if we look at the terms here, if we do the n plus 1 term here, we'd be looking at the 3x to the 17th over 17. If you look at your, your third term right here, what is this? If we had to differentiate that to get g, we'd have 3 t to the 17th over 17. And so ultimately, what we want to do is take that n, n plus 1 term and show that if it, if it is less than a fifth, then we're good to go. I'm gonna, I'll talk a little bit more about it in a minute. I mean, obviously, the, the algebra of it is very simple. We're just going to put a 1 in there and show that 3 17 is less than a fifth, which it clearly is. And if we got a common denominator for, the, common denominator for this, it would be 8, 7. Um, actually, we'd have to get 75, I guess. <coughs> 
bottom line here is that the, this is less than this, which ultimately guarantees that our uh, answer is less than a fifth. One of the parts of the remainder estimation theorem said essentially this, that if, we, if we're looking for error at, let's say, the second term, and we go and look at the next term after the second term, which is the third term in this case. Okay. If that term evaluated at the point in question okay, is going to be our error, if you will, our error estimation for the second term. Okay. And so this 3 17th, that's our error estimation for the second term. Okay. So again, if we, if we want to do this for the fourth term, Okay, then we would have put one into the fifth term and saw what the error was. And that is, that, that's going to be an error estimate for the fourth term. So anytime we have a list of terms, whatever many there are, if we want to find the error estimation for the nth term, we can just put the value into the n plus one term, and that gives us an error estimation. Okay. Um, we didn't really have too many problems like that in our book. And I, I think next time I'll try to find some more that are actually that question. We'll see, I have a feeling we'll see that again here coming up in our other problems that we're going to do. But, <coughs> um, but ultimately, it, it comes from that remainder estimation theorem. So with that said, keeping in mind that if we're looking for either the er error estimation or to show that the error estimation is less than something, okay, all we need to do is just take the n plus 1 term okay, and plug in our number, which in this case we're asking for at 1. So that's why we put a 1 in here. And if that number is less than... It's either going to be that's going to be the error estimation or it's going to be less than something. In this case, they gave us the less than part, so we just want to show that it's less than that. Okay. So like I said, mechanically, it's a pretty easy problem. We just got to make sure that we understand that theorem well enough to know what to do with that information because we got, you know, like I said, there's really no way for us to find big M here. We actually come up with the <coughs> any other remainder estimation from the remainder estimation theorem. So this is when we need to uh, invoke this particular property, which, like I said, you want the remainder estimation in a situation like this, we can get it from the n plus 1th term. And like I said, ultimately, we can show that it's less than a fifth, and we're good to go. And <coughs> the, uh, the problem in itself is only worth one point. So like I said, as we do some more of these problems from our uh, AP problems, we'll, uh, we'll likely see a couple more like that so we can kind of get the hang of uh, when we use that property and when we don't. Other questions for I move on.